Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be here in Victoria. Uh, in fact, it's good to be out of New South Wales and uh, be able to uh, uh, travel and fly. And it was a novelty to be on the plane this morning. I forgot to check in. I forgot to get myself a boarding pass. I forgot a lot of things. Uh, uh, but we are here. We're in place. So we're ready to go. Uh, and uh, do appreciate Pastor Elliot inv inviting my wife and I down to Victoria and uh, we have been praying in earnest for you. Uh, we've been praying in earnest for you during the lockdown. We've been praying in earnest for you for the conference. And uh, I'm looking forward to all that God's going to do this week. I'm glad to be in conference. Glad to be uh, under preaching. Very, very good preaching this morning. I uh, uh, feel challenged and blessed. Uh, and I pray that God uh, would use uh, the couple of slots I've got to, uh, to minister his word to your life uh, Amen. So John chapter 13, if you have a Bible this morning, John chapter 13, all those watching on live stream, g'day. And uh, I have a great face for radio, and so uh, maybe you can just put your screen down and listen to the audio, uh, and that'll, uh, that'll be a blessing to you. John chapter 13 and verse number 33 is my text this morning. In 1991, uh, U.S. President George Bush visited Bancroft Primary School in Virginia to read a book to them. And he sat down uh, next to an eight-year-old boy called Anthony Henderson. And Anthony looked at George Bush uh, and he asked the question, are you really the president? Mr. Bush initially was surprised. He took out his driver's license uh, where it had the name George Herbert Walker Bush. But uh, Anthony was not convinced, so Mr. Bush pulled out more cards. American Express, Social Security, no. Uh, he then offered Anthony a ride in the presidential black limousine, hoping to prove uh, that he was the president. Uh, and uh, Anthony said, I'm not allowed to ride in cars with people that I don't know, and uh, turned, down, turned down the ride. I, uh, the world today is not just looking for the proof of who is the president, but the world is looking for proof that you and I are bona, bona fide Christians. And there are lots of ways that people uh, say certain things, carry certain things, uh, maybe even wear certain things to try and prove their bona fides as Christian, but it's far more than uh, I go to church or carry a Bible or uh, I say that I'm a born-again Christian. And in our text, I believe that Jesus gives us the proof of how we are to demonstrate to the world that you and I are bona fide Christians, and, and there's a critical aspect to our ability or our uh, development as Christians, it's, that's our ability, our willingness, uh, and our passion for building relationships. So I want to preach about building relationships this morning uh, as the proof for your relationship with God. John chapter 13 and verse number 33, the Bible says these uh, uh, words, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer, and you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another." Let's look first of all at the relationship necessity. As Pastor Woods mentioned this morning, some of the mantras of the COVID-19 era, era are social distancing, physical distancing, uh, keep yourself separate. Uh, uh, but while that may be valid, obviously, for a season of a pandemic and viruses and so forth, uh, can I say there's no better predictor of mental instability uh, than separation from people. You and I are wired by God to connect with one another, and to the degree that you are unable or unwilling to connect with your fellow human beings, and obviously in our context with your fellow Christians, to the degree you're unwilling to do that, you become screwy. In the 50s and 60s, China began using solitary confinement to brainwash 
American POWs, and so the U.S. government wanted to see uh, what effect uh, uh, that would have on their own uh, people, and so they began researching the effect of solitary confinement uh, on their citizens, and they were astonished uh, at how effective solitary confinement was uh, as a way of uh, challenging people's uh, stability. They had volunteer subjects, they were deprived of all human interaction, and after only a few hours of solitary confinement, they became restless, they began to talk to themselves, they were anxious and emotional, they were unable to do simple arithmetic or word association tests. Most alarming was they began to hallucinate. Just a few hours of solitary confinement, they began to hallucinate. Uh, they had no control over what they imagined they heard uh, or what they imagined that they saw. Uh, and so the effects of uh, solitary confinement were so dramatic uh, that they immediately stopped the experiment. So we can't put people through this solitary confinement. Uh, so obviously, we're not replicating that in our normal lives. Uh, but to the degree... Like I said, you are unwilling or unable to genuinely connect with fellow human beings and in our context, people within the church or the fellowship. To that degree, you have corresponding impact. Pastor Woods mentioned our relationship with God, our relationship with our pastor our relationship with our peers, and our relationship with other people, all four of those are necessary for mental stability. Relationship with God, your pastor, your peers, and people, all four of those relationships are essential to your mental health. And like that experiment showed, uh, when you don't have those kinds of connections to the degree or the quality that they need to be, certain things begin to happen, like it, you begin to hallucinate. You see things that didn't happen. You think things that never were. You hear things that weren't said. Why do, why do they think that? Why do they see that? It never happened. It didn't go down, yet they have imagined it. Why? Because they're not in relationship. A number of years ago, it's kind of a bit of a folklore in the Parramatta congregation. Uh, one of the young guys, I, I sent him a text, and in the text, uh, uh, I had put some, some words, whatever the communication was, uh, and then I just put three points dot, 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 like three full stops, dot, dot, dot. He got the text, dot, dot, dot. What does pastor mean by that? What does that mean? And he couldn't get over the dot, dot, dot. What's that? So he goes to my sons and goes, what does your dad mean by dot, dot, dot? They go, what do you mean? He goes, Dot, dot, dot on the text. Look, 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 look. I think he just likes to finish off his text with dot, I don't know, just a dot, dot, dot. No, 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 there's more to it than that. And this guy was consumed, couldn't sleep. Finally, he had to come and confront me at church. Pastor, help me out. What did you mean by the dot, dot, dot? What have I done wrong? What, where am I falling short? What's happened here? I said, it's just a dot, dot, dot. You're imagining things. People hear things that weren't said. Have had the unfortunate situation to have to be in conversation with people over the years and, and to try to you know, resolve conflict to some degree. And I'm saying, I, I, I never said that. And go back and forth, I never said that. And then they would say something along the lines of, yeah, but that's what I thought you said. Or that's what I took away from it. Or that was my perspective on that. That's a hallucination. It's a lack of relationship that's caused them to be that way. Uh, and of course, the end is you begin to hate people that you have no business hating. No relationship. Why do you hate them? No real, no, no real reason why. It's just been that way, and that's the way that it is. And now I hate them because we're not in good relationship. 
And what's worse is you isolate with other kinked people and that your life really is going to go down the toilet. Amen. <laughs> you guys have been in a season of isolation. It's been locked down and so forth. Uh, and that, uh, that, uh, that aside, uh, can I encourage you that we are a fellowship? That the Victorian churches, the New South Wales churches, Queensland, Northern Territory, West Australia, South Australia, Tasmania, uh, we're a fellowship of churches. Uh, in every individual church, you are a congregation. You are meant to be a force in the earth. As a state, a force in the earth and relationships are one of the keys to your success uh, and God's favor upon your life. There's a second thought. And that's the requirements to nurture. If you were to Google something as simple as, you know, uh, why the best are the best, and you can come up with articles, uh, uh, a bit like Pastor Allen in the Forbes magazine article and so forth, why are the best the best, uh, and you come up with various lists of qualities that different people have uh, used to research it, why the best are the best. Uh, you get things like take personal responsibility, as we heard. Uh, you have a clear vision or a goal for your life. Uh, uh, you've got to be comfortable in the midst of chaos is another one. Self-awareness. Uh, but somewhere along the lines, people skills is one of the preeminent, if I, if I can put it that way, one of the preeminent qualities, character traits. Is it somewhere along the lines, the person who is the best of the best, they've developed some people skills. Say people skills. They simply are able to get along with other people. It's absolutely vital to uh, their success. So Jesus' desire in our text is that his disciples would become the best of the best. I want, these, I want these 12 men to be able to reach an entire globe, six degrees of separation. These 12 uh, could reach uh, the, the entire world as we know it and start something uh, that goes all down through the last 2,000 years to you and I here today. He wants to make them the best of the best. And in verse 34, he tells them in our text, he's, I'm leaving little while and you won't see me any longer. I'm physically leaving the earth. My physical presence is no longer going to be with you. And therefore, I've given you a new commandment that you love one another. As I have loved you, he says, you also must love one another. Now, if I could read between the lines, how many have ever preached on the, on the 12 ordinary men who were the disciples? Different backgrounds, different age groups, uh, different mental abilities, different academic uh, prowess, different people. Uh, and what he's saying to these guys is, listen, as I have put up with you, I want you to put up with one another. That's what he's saying. I'm asking a little... It's not even a message paraphrase. That's my own paraphrase. As I've put up with you, as I've had to work with your different personalities and egos and various motivations and perspectives, uh, your strengths and your weaknesses, your mood swings and your emotions, uh, I now command you. This is not an option. I'm now commanding you that you do the same for one another. That's good preaching. Can you say amen? amen. Not just a suggestion. Not just a mental health imperative. He's saying your entire Christian experience and the success of the gospel enterprise is going to depend upon you 12 guys getting on with one another. It's not, if you, if I, he's saying, if I, if I can't get that to work, the entire gospel enterprise comes to a grinding halt. I preach for guys, I used to preach for guys, uh, but I, uh, uh, and maybe one day again I will, uh, but I preach for guys, 
And I preached in different settings, different sized churches, different settings, large cities, small cities, and different places. Uh, but I, I, sometimes you come across a guy in a large city. Five churches around him, 10 even larger, 20 and even larger numbers of churches. Uh, and yet somehow in the midst of all of that, they're isolated. And, and I'm thinking, and there's invariably, they're not, you know, they're not filled with victory, if I can put it that way. There's some things that they're struggling with, and many times the answer is nothing more complex than listen, you've got to get on with some people. You have to try and reach out and build some relationships. You're starting to hallucinate. You're not seeing things the way they really need to be seen. And they're making sacrifices, they're making decisions, they're working hard, they're busy, all of those kinds of things. And yet they're sabotaging their ministries right there, no relationships. One of the reasons why Jesus put Matthew 18 in the Bible is this resolve it and get on. Resolve it and move forward. Deal with it, put it behind you, and get on with what it is that God's called you to do. You say, Pastor, what if my brother hasn't sinned against me? What if he's just disagreeable? Does that give me an excuse? What if we've had a disagreement? What if we have different perspectives on life and the way things ought to be done? Does that give me an excuse? I don't think so. One of the outflows of our entitled generation, and Pastor Allen uh, uh, you know, touched on it a little bit in his sermon there, one of the outflows of our entitled generation uh, is all of us feel we have an entitlement to have an opinion upon everything and everyone and hold that to like it's gospel uh, when it isn't. You know, I shouldn't have to put up with that. I can't function alongside disagreeable people. Jesus gives us no free pass. A new commandment. No appendix at the back of the book that says, unless, of course, your situation appears there. You know, men who are no longer with us, they lose fellowship long before they leave the fellowship. They lose fellowship long before they leave the fellowship. Uh, there are several qualities I want to challenge you to nurture this morning. Obviously, the big three are character, integrity, ethics, morals, righteousness, purity, all those sorts of things. There's anointing, a spiritual dimension. In a spiritual dimension, God working with you. Uh, and like I said before, people skills. And uh, I've known many people of solid character, uh, heavy anointing, uh, no people skills. And when you lose one of those three, it's like a three-legged stool. <laughs> You're going to fall over. So to cultivate some people skills and some relationship skills, let me give you a couple of tips this morning. Number one. It'll reinforce your ability to listen. Say, listen. Make a deliberate decision to not do all the talking. A deliberate decision. I won't do all the talking. I'm going to do some listening. Three common delusions. One is that you're a good driver. The second is that you have a good sense of humor. And the third is that you're a good listener. And the last is the most dangerous. That you think you're open, you're transparent, you're, you're a good listener when you're not. Ralph Waldo Emerson said these words, every man I meet is in some way my superior and I can learn from him. Dal Carnegie says you can make more friends in two months uh, by becoming interested in other people uh, than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. They say that God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. 
has to do with percentages and proportions. Less speaking, more listening. Be more interested in finding out more about them than telling them more about you. Be impressed and interested as opposed to impressive and interesting. Listen. Number two, request the right kinds of information often. One of the greatest or easiest ways to become a good listener is to become a good question asker. The ability to ask the right question of the right people and then listen to the answer and put those things into practice uh, is going to accelerate your relationship with God and your ministry. Warren Buffett, uh, anybody know who Warren Buffett is? Know the name? He's like the godfather of investing and been investing for, I think he's in his 80s now, uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, the company that he is the the head of uh, uh, oversees, you know, multiple billions of dollars worth of uh, worth of resources and money under his, uh, under his control there. He himself is worth about $100 billion. $100 billion, U.S. dollars. And so each year they auction off a lunch with him. Get a chance to have lunch with the guy who's the godfather of investing. Last year, the auction, uh, the, uh, the figure paid was $6 million that somebody paid. I want to have a lunch with Warren Buffett to bring a few of my friends along. Now, don't you know that most of the conversation is going to be them asking him questions? You're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be spruiking your, uh, your idea for a, you know, a bamboo recyclable, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, washboard or some other thing. You, you, you forget, your, forget your plans completely. You're with the guy who, by experience and by evidence, knows what he's talking about. You'd ask him some questions. And like I said, every man you meet is in some way your superior. And you can learn from them. They said that millions had seen an apple fall, but only Isaac Newton asked the question, why? No one says, he who asks questions may seem a fool for five minutes, uh, but he who doesn't ask questions is a fool for a lifetime. How many questions do you ask, disciple? Pastor. How many questions, Pastor, do you ask of your peers? Like they might know something more than you. Well, I wouldn't want to look like I didn't know what I was talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> We're all learning. Can you say amen? Are you humble enough to say amen to that? How many questions do you ask? Interesting at uh, morning tea this morning. What, we didn't set this up, Pastor, but uh, uh, Pastor's saying, listen, we've got a couple, of, uh, a couple of people from out of town here. Maybe you guys want to ask some questions. And I don't want to be bombarded. By, you know, but, you know, but the idea being that questions, building relationships, people skills. Number three, remember what's important to other people not just what's important to you. One of the challenges I bring to my ushers, and I'm sure it's true in other churches, but I always ask them, I want you to know the name of every person who walks through the front door and their children. They're like, come on, Pastor. I say, can you imagine somebody after a week of, of, of whatever they have to go through, they come in Sunday morning, and someone that, you know, is not, they're not really in their circle says, uh, good to see you, Sarah. And how's Johnny going at school today? And, uh, and, 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 and the other daughter there? And, yeah, and so that, that, that thing, man, what a church. Just Why? Because their name's important to them. Imagine a parent and the usher knows the names of their children. 
from time to time, I'll be back. The song service begins on a Sunday morning. The way we kind of run our service, I'm at the back there, and we, the song service begins. And, and someone will walk in late, and I'll go up to the usher and say, what's their name? <laughs> and I say, you're sacked. You're going to be on nursery for a month, and then you're going to come back and learn, learn some names and come back again. But find out what's important to other people. Verse 34, love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He's saying, listen, the way that I've treated you. If you look back in the context in chapter 13, that begins with him washing their feet. They've got together, they've all walked there, they've got dusty feet, they've got their sandals on, and none of the disciples, they're all too proud and arrogant to wash one another's feet. And so Jesus, the leader, washes their feet because that's what they need. And he's saying, as I have served your needs, as I have done to you what is valuable to you, you do what's valuable to one another. Find out what would be valuable to them and then serve them. And meet those needs. In the book Unbroken, Louis Zamperini talks about him and two other guys from the boat being in the lifeboat. And uh, it's early days in their, uh, in their being marooned on the boat there. And they had a tiny amount of water, a couple of chocolate bars. And so what they did was they divided up the portions of chocolate bars and water, the supplies, uh, to last the three of them for one week. Just small amounts each day. Uh, let's get through a week. Maybe we'll be rescued. Maybe we'll find an island, whatever it might be. Uh, and he tells the story that in the middle of the night, one of the guys woke up and ate all the chocolate and drank all the water. <laughs> Two people on the boat survived. The selfish guy didn't survive because when you're only concerned about you, it's a shriveling, it's a, it's a draining thing. There's no life in being selfish. Number four, relish a shared life. Begin to relish the busy, fellowshipping, with people type of life. I always laugh when young, young people, people under 60, uh, when, <laughs> and you invite them for some fellowship. They say, oh, you know what? It's, it's nine o'clock. <laughs> Been kind of busy. Well, go home to your miserable little private life. Relish the shared life. <laughs> should, I be da should I dance now? What's this? <laughs> Relish the shared, busy, fellowship, relationship, concentrated type of life. If you're too busy to maintain relationships, you're too busy. If you're too busy to come to church three times a week, you're too busy. If you're too busy to not build relationships, you're too busy. You've got wrong priorities. Uh, relish a shared life. And number five, refuse to keep a record of wrongs suffered, whether hallucinatory <laughs> or real. Uh, refuse to keep a record of wrongs, off, wrongs suffered. 1 Corinthians 13, speaking about love for one another, uh, Paul says love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It's a little, a little nuggets in the Bible. The genuine fellowship and genuine relationship means that you're not a list keeper. The older brother was a list keeper. 
I've done this, I've done that, you haven't done, and he's a list keeper. And Paul says one of the true practical definitions of you love one another is you don't keep a record of wrong suffered. And the only way that genuine, you know, church fellowship, state fellowship, Fellowship amongst churches can ever work is you keep no records of wrong suffered. Clara Barton was the founder of the U.S. Red Cross, and she was reminded of a revolting person <laughs> and a violation that she'd endured at their hands years, years before. But when she was reminded of this person and the situation, she acted as if she had never even heard of the incident. Her friend says, don't you remember it? No, came Barton's reply. I distinctly remember forgetting that. And from time to time, fellow pastor, pastor's wife, disciple, from time to time, you have to, in a sense, you know, write out a mental list and then choose to forget them. You keep cataloging, you keep listing, you keep a record of that stuff. You're never going to survive. And you certainly won't thrive. I close one final thought. That's the rewards that are noted here in our text. Verse 35, by this, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What's the evidence that you have a relationship with God, that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, I carry a big Bible, Pastor. It's the Holy Ghost Bible. <laughs> I come to morning prayer. I go to church. Uh, bah, 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 bah. He says, no, by this. This is the distinguishing mark of true discipleship is the ability to get on with people. That's the proof. And you can tell me all the scriptures you've memorized and all the doctrines you know and, all, and how you get your, your sermon. You can tell me all the stuff. If you can't get on with people, he says, that's the proof. Serious business if you can't get on with other people. Nothing more destructive in a local church than division. The rewards are incalculable of a loving one another culture. Two things, I'm going to close with these. Number one is you want to experience the presence of God in relationships. Jesus says to these guys, I'm no longer going to be with you. And we know in another gospel, he speaks about the advantage of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost coming in Acts chapter 2. We understand the principle of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But in this context, he's saying, I'm, I'm no longer going to be with you physically. But you can experience my presence in relationship. There's something about relationship and the presence of God that are linked. I'm not long, I'm not going to be here, and I want you to love one another. He's saying, you know what? You can sense the presence of God in fellowships. And I, I thank God for preaching. I preach it, altar calls, all that stuff. But I've also experienced the presence of Jesus Christ in fellowship. A dimension of the Holy Ghost. Getting together with other like-minded, fellow-minded, potter's house Christian people. And simply, you know, getting together, talking about the things of God, sharing a laugh, you know, having a joke, thinking about the few, whatever it might be, and sensing the presence of God. You ever sense that in your relationships? He says, you can have my presence if you love one another. There's nothing quite like the local church when it's functioning right. People are getting on with other people. They're not keeping lists of the she said and he said and, you know, they didn't do and all the rest of the things that can become, you know, part and parcel of the church life. Uh, they love one another. Uh, they're in relationship with each other. Uh, and there's nothing quite like the local church when it's functioning right. Not just friendly, but friends. 
not just politeness, but helpfulness, uh, not just lip service, but real service. You can have the right theology, the best programs. You can have sound financial management. Unless we have love for one another, uh, there's no favor. A lot of uh, churches use this text as a sense of ecumenicalism that we should be getting on with every other church in town. Forget that. We have enough trouble with our own little bunch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> God help me. It's not about all the churches getting together and then there'll be a revival. It says if just, if just one church can get on with each other, one fellowship can get on with it, then the people will sit up and take notice. So number one, you can experience the presence of Jesus Christ in relationships. Uh, the second one is you can experience the influence of Jesus Christ in evangelism. What makes the unsaved sit up and take notice is people from different backgrounds, different age groups, different nationalities, different cultures, different work experience, different people all working together for a common cause and common goal of seeing the lost one, that makes the unsaved sit up and take notice. It always, I'm just always thrilled when somebody comes to church and says, well, I just, when I walked in the building, I sensed something that was different. Something about this. They don't always say that, but when, I, when they do, I'm very impressed. Tragic stories over the years of church people downloading their grumbles and their gripes and their grievances to new people. What the heck are you thinking? We exist for sinners. We exist for visitors. We exist for souls. People sense hypocrisy. They want the real deal uh, and the reward of this genuine kind of love for one another uh, is influence. You know, we know the word agape is sacrificial love. Jesus uses the word at 12 times in chapters 1 to 12. The Bible has that uh, once per chapter in the first 12 chapters. Uh, as he's about to leave, uh, he triples the number. It's just in there all the time. Chapters 13 to 21, love one another. This is the key, guys. When I'm gone, we've got to build the church. We've got to reach the lost. Love one another. He's, he's, he's emphasizing that aspect of it. If you want your church to grow, you want your church to have influence, this is one of the keys. Years ago, I closed with this. In Belgium, evangelism was getting nowhere. The nation had a long history of racial conflict, disillusionment with the Catholic Church. Uh, the aggression of cults meant that they were impervious as a nation to the gospel. And so the few genuine Christians there in Belgium were driven to the scriptures. And one church read our text and devised a plan for evangelism. They got a number of single missionaries from Belgium, some Dutch, some Americans, some British, different nationalities, got these single missionaries to rent a house and live together for seven months. Naturally, there's fractions, there's frictions. They developed, they drove them to prayer, there was forgiveness, and then finally victory. After the seven months, when they went out to witness to others, uh, they saw amazing fruit. Something changed in the nation of Belgium because something had transpired in a group of people. And sinners began to call that church uh, the people who love each other and they wanted to be a part of it. The people who love one another, we want to be a part of that. Uh, amen. Let's bow our heads. going to close in a word of prayer. The proof building relationships. Before I move to other things, you're here, you're not a Christian, but where we're watching by live stream, people on, uh, online uh, watching, and uh, uh, you perhaps don't know Jesus Christ, can I tell you the most important thing about this entire morning services is do you know Jesus Christ? 
The Son of God came to earth 2,000 years ago, died, rose again from the dead, uh, and is right now ready to intercede for you. You can find forgiveness of your sins. Uh, Jesus Christ can become your Lord and your Savior uh, and change your life forever as it's changed all of ours uh, and millions besides. Uh, if you're here this morning in the building, you're not saved. Maybe you're watching by live stream, you're not saved. Would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not right with God. I'm not born again. I need Jesus Christ to touch my life. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Those by live stream, if that's you, would you pray this prayer? Father, I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. I ask your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died upon the cross for my sins. He rose again from the dead. I repent of my sins. Uh, let the blood of Jesus wash me clean, uh, make me whole, uh, and I commit myself to live for Jesus from this day forward. Uh, in Jesus' name, uh, amen. If you're watching by live stream, uh, you can go to our website. You can get an email address there. Send us your information. We'll pray for you, send you some details, help you to find a local church. Amen. Been a great morning of ministry. Uh, we had a couple of sermons this morning. Uh, Pastor Mark uh, preached about appreciation, the need for gratitude, to, you know, wake up and smell the roses and uh, take time as we are going through difficult seasons to make sure we don't lose sight of the good things uh, that we're enjoying and the good things that Jesus Christ is doing. Pastor Allen preached on leadership, uh, a classic sermon on leadership and how you can lead and have influence uh, and the various ways you can take responsibility and bring about change in your own life, your family, and your environment. Uh, and I've preached upon relationships I preached this uh, just in July in the, the local New South Wales area, preached to all the local area pastors and challenged them as I'm challenging you this morning along these lines. The proof is your ability, your willingness, your passion for getting on with other people. Lots of other ways we can preach this, but if you, uh, to the degree that you isolate yourself, you're not in good relationship with God. You're not in good relationship with your pastor, your peers, or people. To the degree that you're not in good relationship, something's missing in your life, and the tragedy is you don't even know it's missing. You think you've got a full perspective. You think that your perspective is right, but it's not. Your perspective can only be clarified by being in right relationship in those areas. Like I said, Jesus says, I'm going physically. You can experience my presence in fellowship. Uh, and if you want lasting fruit and influence and fruitfulness and revival, uh, all of those kinds of things, it comes through being in relationship with one another. Let's all stand across the building this morning. The altars are open. Now you come forward and find a place to pray. If there's somebody with you that you brought that's not saved, you can invite them to come and pray a sinner's prayer. You come forward, find a place to pray. Begin to lay hold of God. Ask God how that applies to you. God, is there any areas of my life where I'm overlooking? I, I'm not developing. I'm not pressing in. Maybe one of those five keys to people skills that you may have touched on that somehow in your life, this is a factor for you. Uh, you begin to pray. Ask God to help you uh, as they sing a song of worship this morning. And oh my notes but I do feel that I want to do this this morning and that is that I want you just to take a minute just to think about those four significant relationships God pastor peers and people and without you know digging with you know digging and trawling if there's something that just pops into your mind of an offense a situation a circumstance something you're angry at God about Perhaps something with your pastor, maybe a peer, maybe just people in your church, people, whatever it might be. Again, yeah, without digging, without trawling, but just something that you know is kind of quite fresh. It's quite, it's quite warm. It's there. It's just it's it's it's, it's in your mind. I'm going to take time this morning to pray with you. 
that like Paul said to the Corinthian church, that I will refuse from this point on to keep track of that. Like the lady who's the head of the Red Cross, I deliberately remember choosing to forget that. Healthy in life, she's healthy in relationships, life's going on because I deliberately chose to put that under the blood, the foot of the cross, uh, I'm going to move on. And maybe that's you this morning. Heads about, eyes are closed. No looking around. There's just something that pops into your mind. You raise your hands. That's me. Yes, quickly put your hand up. Amen. Hands going up. We're not digging. We're not going deep. We're just, just it's, it's right there, fresh. I want you to say, Jesus, I thank you for the clarity and the conviction that I feel right now about these offenses, I make a deliberate decision. I repent of holding on to these. I ask your forgiveness. I make a deliberate choice right now to put these behind me. I choose to remember them no more. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse me. Break the curse of bitterness from off my life. I commit myself to move forward in healthy relationships with all those you've placed in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's begin to thank God this morning. Father God, I thank you today for the blood. I thank you for the Holy Ghost. I thank you for the Spirit of God. Hallelujah.